Another day, another disappointing result for Chelsea Football Club. Hell to a nil-nil against a team that we should almost always be beating is never a good thing, but looking back at the VOD paints a slightly different picture. So, what really happened during this game? Let's find out. Lads, lasses and the rest of the masses, welcome back to the channel. I'm Mono from Mono CFC, and this is my post-match tactical breakdown for Chelsea versus Bournemouth. This match was mostly the same story that we've been seeing from Chelsea in recent times, and I'm going to start off by talking about the first half. I want to preface here that I will be talking about this game from a Chelsea perspective, so I won't be particularly talking about how Bournemouth performed, but I will give them their credit here. They managed to keep us out and created a few decent chances in the game, and without the interventions from Robert Sanchez, they could have easily won this game by at least two goals. Bournemouth and Chelsea both struggled from similar issues in this game, which I'll highlight in a moment. Let's talk about the Chelsea system first, which was slightly different to what we've been seeing. Chelsea continued to use a 4-3-3 slash 4-2-3-1 formation, but with Levi Colwell in left back. We did finally see a natural left winger in Mudrick playing instead of Ben Chilwell, which was good to see. Leslie Ukachukwu came in to play as a lone six for the majority of the game, which gave the other two midfielders the license to push up further, slightly changing our shape. I'm going to break this down into three major factors which I believe stopped us from winning this game. Let's start with the first one, our final ball is woeful. Our build up play at times is superb, especially when we are being pressed. We saw this in this game, from our goal kicks when Bournemouth pressed up high, we rather easily played our way out and got into the attacking third, but almost every time we get to that final pass before a goal, it goes awry. Whether we are talking about the shots coming in, the cutbacks, the crosses or the final through pass, it just never seemed to go in our favour, and this has been happening for far too long at Chelsea. And to be quite honest, I don't have the solution for this one, it's just on the players. I put Poch into my ugly box in GBU after the game and a few comments I got told me I was being harsh on him, but I should reiterate here in this video that wasn't for his tactics in general, just a few odd decisions he made. I don't think Poch is to blame for our woes in the slightest because as the old proverb goes, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. All of our players have been led to the riverbank, but just won't take a sip. Usually I'd have some solution to this problem, but I think this is just a matter of having to play together more, and more training outside of games. Eventually the pieces will fall in place, but that's going to take patience from the Chelsea fanbase that I know the majority of us don't have, myself excluded. The second factor I want to talk about is that we rather quickly abandoned what was working early on. One of the only bright lights from this performance was Mikhailo Mudrik, who created the most clear-cut chances for our team in the first half, and was able to link up with Nico Jackson very well, like I predicted in my match preview before the game. But for some reason, despite us finding success down that left-hand side, we just kept forcing it down the right-hand side instead. I'll quickly show here what was going on from a formational perspective. We were trying to transition into this 3-2-5 formation on the ball with Sterling moving into this central space here and Malo Gusto occupying the wide right channel. On the opposite side we didn't do this with Mudrik but with Enzo instead. I have a few issues with us doing this. The first thing is that this position doesn't benefit Enzo and I've spoken about this previously, especially in the Luton game. But Enzo is not a 10, he's an 8 and he functions best when he's occupying these spaces slightly deeper, where he has time and space to pick out passes and can arrive late for shots outside the box if needed. He's filling in for Nkunku or Chukwameka who would usually operate here and is the completely wrong profile of player. In truth, Gallagher and Enzo's positions could literally be straight swapped and it would operate better. The only reason Poch doesn't do this, I believe, is because Gallagher is a better runner in midfield and can help out defensively if we lose the ball in transition, whereas Enzo is not the quickest and can be a liability at times in those areas. Of course, if we had Lavia or Caicedo or both, this wouldn't be an issue, but Poch is having to make do with what he has. The second reason I don't like this is that in this system, it almost forces Mudrik to play as a hybrid between a left winger and a left wing back, and we saw from his stats that he had the most tackles from anyone in the side in the first half, and he covered an enormous amount of the pitch, running up and down. He would operate better cutting inside onto his right foot and running towards goal, not back to his own. We saw a few occasions where he could drop into these positions as Enzo dropped a little deeper, and immediately we saw chances being created from here with Jackson now able to link up with his winger. But it didn't happen enough as this formation is very lopsided to the right hand side. Instead, we saw this pattern of play. 
De Sassi piercing a ball into Gallagher, Gallagher into Sterling, and then Sterling into Malo Gusto. The issue with this is that Gusto's final ball, as we spoke about earlier, wasn't great, and neither was the decision making in general in this game. Now I know this is a risk due to what I spoke about earlier, but look what can happen if we swap Connor and Enzo here. When this ball comes to Enzo, as his vision, passing and overall technical ability on the ball is much higher than Gallagher's, he doesn't always have to play this pass to Sterling. And Gallagher can now get into positions he's good from, in and around the box like we saw at Crystal Palace. We saw this happen with one of the chances Mudrick created too, when Connor almost scored because he got into this position, but this wasn't the default so we hardly saw it. Going back to Enzo, he has more options due to his capabilities, he can play this ball to Gusto early creating more space, he can switch the ball to Mudrick and get him running at his fullback, or even play this direct ball into Jackson, who hardly saw the ball in this game. And that's the third factor I wanted to talk about. There was almost zero service to Jackson in this game, and when he finally did get the ball, he felt cold, because he had hardly gotten a touch. He made so many runs off the ball that weren't picked out, because again, Gallagher was here instead of Enzo, and Sterling was more content to play the ball wide to Gusto. The only time Jackson really got involved was when he was combining with Mudrick, who once again just didn't get the ball enough. We saw this in pre-season, playing those early balls into Jackson is how he gets his goals. He's unable to do this if that ball never comes and we recycle the ball. Now I'm going to move on and talk about the second half, but before I do, real quick, if you're enjoying the content and want to see more, please consider subscribing to the channel. Cheers. Alright, so what happened in the second half? Well, we actually started the second half well, playing it down the left hand side this time and immediately getting Mudrick involved. This led to the first and only big event that happened in the game, Levi Colwell's disallowed goal. We push Enzo out wide and allow Mudrick to play in this favoured half space, where he is able to run at the defence and draw a silly foul from Max Ahrens. Side note, this should have 100% been a yellow card. We saw almost the exact same challenge happen to a Bournemouth player, and the Chelsea man got carded for it. I don't like to talk about refereeing decisions because I get people in my comments saying I'm salty or whatever, but by god the ref clearly favoured one team more than the other, and that's all I'll say on the matter. This sets up Raheem Sterling for a direct free kick, which he cannons off the crossbar, but it doesn't have enough spin to take it over the line. Levi Colwell follows up and sticks it into the back of the net, but the linesman rightly flags for offside, and the goal is disallowed. This is a prime example of why Levi shouldn't be playing at left back in my opinion. If an actual left back is in this position, I guarantee they don't get caught this far offside and we score the goal. We also get another example almost immediately after, with Colwell making a surging underlapping run and getting himself into a great position in truth, with Chelsea playing some neat football down the left once more, but he gets a nosebleed being that high up the pitch and all decision making goes out of the window. Instead of slipping this through to Mudrick or even just shooting, which would have probably been a better option, he tries to cut it back to a marked Enzo Fernandez, giving the ball away and allowing Bournemouth the chance to counter attack. I guarantee that Chilwell and Matson were both on the bench thinking I could have had a goal and an assist right now. Again, I don't blame Colwell for this, it's not his fault that he's being played out of position. In general, the second half was far more open, and this should have been to the benefit of Chelsea. We're not very good at breaking down low blocks, and are far more suited to transitional counter-attacks. We got a lot of opportunities to do this in the second half, but once again failed to convert any chances. And part of that was due to what happened in the 63rd minute, with Cole Palmer coming on to replace Mikhailo Mudrig. I was glad that Poch was finally starting to use his subs earlier, like I spoke about in my latest 5 Things video, which you can check out by clicking the link in the top right corner, or the one down below in the description for mobile users. But again, this was another case of a baffling decision from Poch. Why did he take off Mudrick and not Sterling, who was having a far worse game? I guess he was trying to manage his minutes or something, but he was our most dangerous attacker and taking him off really stifled us for the rest of the game, down the left side. I don't think Palmer particularly had a good game after coming on either, but I won't talk about that too much because he's only just come to the club, but once again the main reason we struggled to score in this half was a general lack of quality when it really mattered and poor decision making. We had numerous great chances to put the game to bed and they were all squandered by either a poor weight of pass, poor decision or a combination of the two. I'll show a few examples here, Jackson shooting here instead of collecting the ball and playing it across goal, Gallagher overhitting this pass to Jackson so he couldn't shoot first time, Jackson not releasing the ball quick enough here and allowing Bournemouth to get players back, 
Palmer overhitting a pass to Sterling, which he didn't even need to do, he could have taken the strike on himself in truth, making this chance into a half chance for Cole, which was saved. That was the story of this game really, Chelsea once again playing very well but failing to convert anything, and ultimately letting the opposing team off the hook. We need to see a response in our next game against Aston Villa, or I fear we'll seriously be in trouble as our next run of games are all incredibly hard fixtures against some great opposition. I'll be previewing that match too, which should be out on Saturday this week, so make sure you check that out when it's uploaded. And finally, before the end of the video, it's time for the question of the day. As always, I'm going to highlight some of the comments from the last video, so here are a few responses to the last question of the day. Thanks guys for the continued support as ever. If you want your comment to be featured in the next video, as always, leave your answer to this video's question of the day down below with QOTD at the start. So, for this week's question of the day, we'll go for an interesting one. How many points do you see us gaining from this set of fixtures upcoming, and why? But that was just my tactical breakdown for this match, thank you ever so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts on this match in the comment section below, and if you'd be so kind, subscribe to the channel and leave the video a like if you enjoyed. Don't forget to tap the notification bell so you never miss a video from me, or check out some of the other videos on the channel on screen right now. I've been Mono from MonoCFC, and remember, in the rain, or in the dry, keep that blue flag flying high. Come on you blues.